Okay, so let's get started. So uh, good morning and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this time uh, in museum seminar. So um, today it's really my great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Uh, Tedis uh, Steppenbach from Cleveland, Cleveland uh, Clinical. Um, before the seminar, I just give a brief introduction of, um, of Sad. So um, Sad was um, um, get a training for both his MD and PhD from Northwestern University. And then um, and afterwards, he started his uh, resident fellow in pathology in uh, WashU, St. Louis, uh, which uh, he continued his uh, academic career from assistant professor to uh, full professor and then to full the, uh, the Conan professor of uh, pathology and immunology or in uh, WashU Medical School, St. Louis. So, um, and then recently, it's really exciting that <clears throat> uh, from 2020, uh, Sad started his uh, new position in Cleveland Click, uh, Leonard College of Medic Medicine. Uh, and then he became a chair of Department of Information and Immunity of Leonard Research Institute, um, which is also belong to Cleveland Clinic. <clears throat> so um, I think uh, many of us actually are familiar with Sadis' uh, work. Uh, his lab is mainly focused on the de development of new therapeutic targets and basic uh, machinery of pathogenesis of mucosa uh, diseases, which including uh, viral infections. Uh, his uh, main interest in actually uh, on several different topics. Uh, for instance, he, uh, he, he studied the uh, role of chronic viral infection disease and uh, repair. And then he uh, also studied the uh, role of laminal propria cells during the injury repair. Also, he studied the uh, role of bacterial in injury, injury uh, generation and, and, uh, and the repair. And also, he developed a lot of experimental system to actually establish culture primary uh, intestinal epithelial cells from both mouse and human samples, uh, which uh, we know we all know it's uh, pretty challenging. Uh, Sadis lab is really uh, very productive. I think uh, his lab actually uh, generate over 150 different publications from very high profile, and then really uh, significantly contribute to epithelial biology and the mucosal immunology. Um, I saw so his lab actually uh, 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 come out a lot of uh, uh, established and then uh, great trainees, which contribute both in industry and academia. So my per my personally, I really learned a lot from his work, and particular uh, from his, uh, uh, for instance, from his 2016 uh, work, um, he established the uh, really ingenious uh, methodology to actually screening. Uh, uh, microbiome metabolites from uh, zebrafish model. And then um, actually um, also, as I mentioned, he um, dedicated in studying the both mouse and human epithelial biology established different tools, which actually benefit uh, really greatly in the, in the field. So today's talk, um, um, I think Seth is gonna tell us about the penis cell and their role in innate immunity and how they interact with microbiome. So without further ado, I said, Please go ahead. We are looking forward to your talk. Yeah, thanks, Sean. I really, I appreciate the uh, the invitation to this uh, to this uh, forum. And if you have, um, I guess, if you have questions as we go along, if, if they're in the chat, and Sean, if you if, feel free to interrupt me if there's if there's things that if that come up uh, that we need to stop and discuss. I think that's that actually works uh, very well in this forum. Um, so yeah, so uh, so I'm going to talk today um, about uh, really. Work that's been going ongoing in my lab for the last ten years in, in terms of uh, uh, panda cell biology and thinking of them in terms of the innate immune system. But I'm going to I'll spend a few a few um, a few slides just to just to talk about uh, really the role of, of all intestinal epithelial cells as part of the innate immune system. I think that that concept I think is something that's that's emerging from a large number of papers that have come out over the last few years. And I think I think having that. Um, Having that uh, that concept in your head, I think, is, uh, is is really beneficial. It's probably also true of the lung and, and other uh, other mucosal organs as, as well. So I'm going to focus this particular talk um, on the intestinal epithelium. Uh, so this is um, it, it, th this organ has a real challenge, right? 
has to it has to be able to efficiently absorb nutrients along the length of the intestine, but at the same time keep out um, basically everything that comes through your GI tract. Keep this uh, away from uh, away from uh, uh, everything else in your body. And the way that's done is there's a sim a single layer of epithelium that lines the entire uh, length of the of the of the GI tract of the uh, stomach and small intestine and colon. And these epithelial cells have very specialized properties along the length of the gut. So uh, along, uh, as you look uh, in the small intestine, where many nutrients are absorbed, there are very frequent invaginations uh, called crypts or lubricant. So th th these are epithelial cells that are sequestered away from the surface. And then there are epithelial cells that are in contact uh, with, the, with the lumen, and these are, uh, these are on surface villi. These epithelial cells they are, are, are completely continuous. So you can get, you can see here that epithelial cells here in the crypt are continuous up with cells that are, that are present on the villi. This is a very um, active and, and dynamic system. There's a lot of epithelial uh, proliferation, not only from progenitor cells, but also from stem cells uh, in this particular organ. And most of the cells, uh, most of the cells actually migrate up and out of the crypts onto these uh, onto these structures. I'm going to focus on the large part of the talk is going to be um, on panda cells at the base of the crypt here, which are retained in this location. So as I mentioned, there's a number of different um, epithelial lineages that all arise from common stem cell that are present in each, in each, present in each crypt. Um, the the major uh, major cell types that I'm going to at least uh, briefly mention are these five here, uh, including absorptive enterocytes intraendocrine cells, goblin cells, panna cells, which I'll focus on, and type cells. These are just some of the, uh, the features, the ultrastructure features of these cells that I think make them uh, quite unique. Uh, enterocytes are, are tall columnar cells that have abundant microvilli at their surface that are necessary for, uh, for uh, efficient absorption of, of nutrients. This is the dominant cell that lines uh, the, the, the intestinal tract. Then there are a variety of uh, secretory uh, cells uh, here. There are goblet cells that contain these, uh, these granules here that, that contain accumulated mucin that are produced by these cells and these are then uh, secreted. Uh, Panna cells, um, they, they also accumulate uh, uh, glycoproteins as well. They're, these glycoproteins are in these electron dense granules and these get secreted by a process of merocrine secretion. You can note here that there's abundant uh, rough endoplasm particulum in these cells. And this really is, is uh, very much in, in, in keeping with the fact that these cells uh, are a factory for these, anti, these uh, proteins that are secreted in these granules, mostly antimicrobial proteins. And then tough cells have gotten a lot of uh, interest lately. These are, these are cells that have uh, extended uh, microvilli rootlets uh, uh, into the cells, and these are uh, involved in sensing particularly parasites uh, and other types of pathogens. So there is um, much as uh, for those of you that study uh, hematopoietic stem cells, that there's a hierarchy of, of cells that are present uh, with, that, that line the intestinal epithelium, starting with, a, with, a, with intestinal stem cells that are, that are uh, totipotent for all of these cells. There are transient amplifying cells that then become uh, uh, committed to different types of progenitors. Uh, the, the major types of progenitors are for these absorptive enterocytes. And then there's a, secret, a common secretory progenitor for the remainder of the, the cells uh, that perform uh, uh, secretory functions. And the, the key, a key thing to recognize here is so that you have active stem and, and progenitor cell division at the base of these crypts. Cells and cells are constantly moving up and out. So there's this, uh, this migration that's fairly rapid, about one cell uh, length per hour or about uh, 20 microns per hour in these cells, uh, these cells move. So there's an enormous number of cells that are shed into the lumen uh, each day uh, as, as they reach the top of the structures. And then this, the, the programs of these uh, intestinal epithelial cells, particularly enterocytes, vary along the, the length of the intestine, uh, whether you're in various regions of the small intestine or the whole. So there's a number on, um, I just want to mention uh, a few uh, of the other cell types and how they play a role in, in innate uh, biology. The first is really the epithelial stem cells, stem cells themselves. These, uh, these, uh, these cells actually uh, can vary their turnover rate and they're, they're, they're well known to, to vary this turnover rate in response to a number of infections, including viral, bacterial, and parasitic infection. So there's a number of mechanisms that ramp up uh, the, this turnover rate and speed up the rate of migration. 
this this is uh, this is thought to essentially um, if there are pathogens say that are infecting cells in the billets, this increased turnover rate will will shuttle those cells out of uh, away from the host at a faster rate. Uh, so this is really a key innate mechanism, one that's important to remember when you're thinking about infection models. Um, and uh, absorptive enterocytes also have innate functions as well. Um, they have, as I mentioned, they have uh, about 3,000 of these protrusions on their apical surface called microvilli. These are all tethered together in, in a very fine network that's been recently discovered and, and really nicely worked out. This network of, of microvilli has to be uh, has to be really destroyed by invading, invading pathogens such as enteropathogenic E. coli. These uh, these E. coli can bind to these, the surface of these uh, enterocytes. This is a scanning EM of this. These are these are these uh, examples of these bacterial pathogens that are bound to the surface of, of an absorptive enterocyte and focally disrupted the, uh, the the microvilli here. This is really critical for them to be able to to invade uh, uh, the, the epithelial cells. Tough cells, uh, which I mentioned before, which have these long, uh, long microvilli, long rootlets. These cells uh, have, have recently become appreciated to, to play a role in a really interesting circuit that, that involves uh, sensors of different types of infection, particularly parasites and, 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 uh, and worms. That they can produce uh, cytokine IL-25, which can stimulate IL-C2s to make abundant um, and then this can play a role then in, 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 in removal of parasites from this particular uh, organ. So a nice example of kind of an innate function of, of, of another epithelial cell. Uh, Schwann has, has a really beautiful paper that he published in Immunity, Immunity earlier this year, looking at enteroendocrine cells. These are also secretory cells. What their cargo is, is, is hormones. And uh, some of the hormones of these enteroendocrine cells include serotonin, which is when this when this is secreted, this can this can have an effect on gut motility, and this can uh, again aid in parasite expulsion. He found that uh, that IL, the, the cytokine IL thirty three uh, can uh, can help trigger this particular uh, this particular response. I I, my, I have a really nice project with Mike Diamond. I'm not going to talk about today, but we're looking at, at at certain types of viral infection that can actually subvert this uh, that this pathway that Schwann uh, has discovered here and nicely described. Uh, uh, another type, a fourth type of, of innate function of intestinal epithelial cells are goblet cells. So while absorptive enterocytes provide, I think, the physical framework for the barrier function for the epithelium, the goblet cells provide the, 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 really the framework for the chemical barrier that sits above the intestinal epithelial cells. So this particular uh, image here is stained with a, uh, with a, with a dye that stains uh, uh, basically complex sugars. And this, this labels the mucin that's present in these goblet cells that's, that's accumulating and, and goblet cell mucin that's been secreted. So you can see this layer here sitting on top of the epithelial cells. Gunnar Hansen has done, has been a real, has been an amazing pioneer in this particular area, defining uh, uh, goblet cell mucin and its function in, uh, as an innate, uh, essentially as an innate uh, uh, property of, of, of the immune system of the intestine. Without, without a properly functioning uh, uh, goblet cell layer here, uh, pathogens and bacteria have free access then to uh, the epithelium and then this can cause a disruption of the microbiome and, and leads to these infections. There are a number and there are a number, uh, there are a number, a growing number of papers that can show disruption of this goblet cell uh, layer, uh, mutations that affect a variety of processes such as autophagy, reactive oxygen generation, and inflammasomes all have defects in the ability of goblet cells to, to secrete and all have uh, greater susceptibility to infection. So last thing I'm going to come to uh, panel cells. And so this is what I'm going to really focus on uh, in this particular talk. So these cells are, are these epithelial cells are unusual. Um, all the other epithelial cells that I just discussed are cells that migrate up and out of the crypts onto uh, uh, villous structures. But panel cells are retained and, and, and remain behind. Their half-life uh, is, is approximately two to three months. For most of the other epithelial cells, it's on the order of days. So these cells basically park at the base of crypts, and they're there for, for an extended period of time. The key thing is that they're in very close contact with the stem cells at the base of the crypt, and they provide one of the, one of the niches for stem cells in the base of the crypt. They provide uh, uh, factors that are really important for crypt cells to actually, crypt stem cells to actually exist in this particular 
So they, their, their main function is to, as I mentioned, is they're, they're, they make abundant uh, antimicrobial proteins. Uh, the most well-known are probably the alpha defensins. There are two of these in, in humans, um, HD5 and HD6. Uh, and in mice, uh, through de gene duplication, there's a, a much larger population of these um, alpha defensins that, that can be made in various strains of mice. And Andy Ouellette is really the, uh, the expert, I think, in this area of defining the basic biochemistry of these, uh, of these uh, defensins. So these, these, these alpha defensins, or cryptins, as they're called, are really small, uh, highly cationic, broad-spectrum uh, inter intermicrobial uh, proteins. In mice, they're activated by MMP7, but, the, the, but not in humans. They're not the only um, antimicrobial that's present. Um, there are other uh, antimicrobials such as reg regu gamma, angiogenin 4, and lysozyme. Uh, and so, but basically everything that's produced has broad spectrum antibiotic, bi uh, bi uh, antimicrobial activity, um, either that's really gram positives like lysozyme, that's really designed to, to destroy the, the uh, peptidic glycan wall, wall of, of gram positive bacteria. But some of these actually have a, a, a really no preference that cryptins can, can actually kill both gram negatives and gram positives. But what's interesting is despite the fact that these, these penicels make and secrete um, all of these um, antimicrobial proteins that make their way into the lumen, there still are bacteria that are able to reside uh, within, the, within the gut. Some of these reside within the within the kind of the, the, the free flow digesta of the intestine, and some of these um, some of these bacteria actually reside in very close to the uh, to the mucosal surface. And there are there are of the twenty or so phyla that exist for bacteria. There are three or four of these phyla that have members that can exist in close. And, and one of these phyla is a phyla that really dominates here are the firmicutes. Uh, and two of the family members are Lachnosporiciae and Rubicoxiae. These are really slow growing bacteria uh, that, that, that for reasons are still unclear are relatively resistant to the antimicrobial proteins that are produced by panacells. cells. And they can live, um, they, these bacteria can live associated with mucus and in very close proximity to the intestinal epithelium and the, and the small intestine. And again, I think a mystery is still why, uh, why these microbes actually selectively can exist here where many other microbes really, really can't, uh, can't uh, survive in this type of but this, uh, but properly functioning panacells, cells again produce, I think, a really important niche for these bacteria. And really, um, what is very important about these microbes that live in this particular area is that they provide colonization resistance against a number of pathogens. So in mice, if you want to, if you want to infect with uh, with uh, with certain types of bacterial pathogens. Uh, you have to give antibiotics to, to effectively try and wipe out a lot of these, these, these close colonizers of, of the gut. So think of these microbes, really, even though they're not part of us, they are part of us and they're part of our very function. And this, I think, is, you know, has, been, has been demonstrated. Nia Salzman's done a lot of really nice work in this area, overexpressing um, HD5 in mice and showing that, that, that you can clear certain types of uh, pathogens and pathobionts in this, this particular system. And what we've shown, and what I'm going to show in, in penicels cells that are defective from a variety of, of means, is that, that, that what we have shown um, is that the, that the, the local microbiome is actually altered uh, when panacea cells are defective. Um, I'm not going to go through a lot of the microbiome data in this talk. I'm going to focus more on the host, but we have, uh, we have uh, shown this in multiple systems. So the, the, really the end product then, think of when I talk about abnormal panacea cells, think of this as, as generating a situation where the microbiome now, at least locally uh, associated with the intestinal epithelium, is no longer, the composition is altered and it no longer has the nice barrier function uh, to pathogens uh, that normally exists. So I'm gonna talk about um, uh, 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 panna cells and, and really a context of what got me really interested in these particular cells, which is inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, I'll give you a little bit of history of what got me interested in this. And then go through some um, go through some of the, the uh, chapters in this particular uh, story that we've been developing now over a long period of time, trying to understand um, how how panna cells can be become defective in, in particular disease states. So the disease state that, that got me interested in in, in panna cells was in, inflammatory bowel disease, and so this is a, a really complicated uh, model system. These these patients have. Uh, spontaneous inflammation uh, in various portions of, of their intestine. These can, uh, these can either uh, relapse or remit uh, for reasons that we, we don't understand. 
But the, the incidence, uh, what actually incites the disease, we're, we're gaining better and better understanding of, is a combination of genetic predisposition um, that really differs upon uh, what your genetic background uh, actually is. I won't go into those details, but I'm happy to, to talk about that. But there's, but in all, but in IBD around the globe, there is a genetic predisposition. And then uh, based on this genetic predisposition, there are a number of environmental factors that can impinge on this. And what this ultimately leads to is multiple, multiple areas of dysregulation. Um, most famously, the immune system becomes uh, really dysregulated. There's the hyperinflammatory responses, both acute and chronic, uh, that occur. There, my, my lab has been very interested in epithelial dysregulation that occurs, and now many labs, I think, are very interested in the microbial dysregulation that occurs. And all three of these uh, uh, really seem to be linked in this particular disease. So what got me interested um, genetically were some of the initial studies in both Europe and, and in North America looking at predominantly Caucasian populations uh, with Crohn's disease. And what was uh, recognized is that there was a, there was a single point mutation in one um, autophagy gene, ATG1601, um, that conferred uh, uh, sensitivity or susceptibility to, uh, to Crohn's disease. It, and in this particular population has a pretty high, uh, high p-value. There's a the risk allele frequency in, the, in this uh, in this group of, of people is very high. So obviously, just having this mutation isn't enough to to generate the disease. There has to be other uh, other factors that, that come into play to actually uh, create the defect that actually uh, leads to to the disease. And what uh, Romnick Xavier and, and and others have sh have shown is that the, the real defect is is when there's stress, particularly cellular stress. This particular amino acid substitution makes this particular protein amenable to breaking apart, essentially. Um, and then it no longer functions properly um, as an autophagy protein. Um, so autophagy protein, so ATG1601 is part of an extension complex uh, for the double membrane uh, structures that are used to, to, to mobilize around uh, uh, defective uh, cellular constituents or pathogens, uh, and then bring them to and del deliver them to, uh, to lysosomes. So ATG1601 with ATG5 uh, and uh, ATG12 are part of a, a complex um, that can extend this membrane. And so we were very surprised uh, when we saw that this genetic hit um, in autophagy uh, playing a role in inflammatory bowel disease. It wasn't clear to us why, uh, what was actually uh, happening here. Um, and so we started looking uh, carefully at uh, some slides that um, of mice that Skip Virgin's lab uh, had made uh, when Ken Cadwell was in his uh, lab. So we, we collaborated, started looking at this together. And what we noticed um, is when we, uh, we looked at the panda cells in these particular mice, that they were, they were uh, very abnormal. Um, so this is a stain for lysozyme, which is one of these antimicrobial proteins that is produced, packaged, and exported by panda cells. So these little granules that you can see within an individual panda cell here are perfectly normal, and this is a normal staining, staining pattern for cells. The, uh, the, the mice that were defective in ATG1601, um, they still made um, all the antimicrobial proteins, but they didn't package them well. You can only see, you can see that there are very few granules that are present, and most of the, most of the protein is actually diffuse in the cytoplasm uh, in this particular mouse. So this, this, and what we showed is that this protein, by not getting packaged in granules, doesn't effectively make it out into the lumen of the gut and doesn't create that selective pressure that allows certain firmicutes to exist in close to the intestine. So what we did, what we realized we could do um, in both mouse and in human specimens is we could phenotype panna cells based on this, uh, this uh, staining for this, particular, uh, for this particular antigen. So we perform immunofluorescence staining for things like lysozyme, look at the pattern, and then go in, and, and to this date, we are still manually count, counting them, but looking at the panacell morphology, just judging whether the panacell is a normal uh, distribution uh, and number of granules, or whether there are these various uh, abnormal forms of panacells that we've, um, we've uh, recognized over the years. And so what we do is we do a, a scoring then, uh, we, we, we count a certain number of panacells within uh, a certain specimen, whether it's a mouse or a human patient, uh, and then determine the number of, of normal panna cells versus abnormal panna cells. And we've now done, we've now done this in over a thousand patients and uh, dozens of mouse lines. 
and the phenotype, the, the, the cutoff that we found is, is, uh, is about 80% of the panel cells. So if, the, if a patient has less than 80% of the panel cells are normal, this is what we call type 1 panel cell phenotype. This, is, this patient really has, uh, has, a, has enough abnormal panel cells to create a particular phenotype. And if the patient has uh, gr greater than 80% normal panel cells, they're type 2, and they, uh, they essentially have normal functioning uh, panel cells by, by all, all, all measures that we can. So then th these scoring systems then for, for patients have been, uh, been very valuable. We can predict time to uh, a faster time to recurrence in patients that have abnormal panel cells versus patients that don't. Um, we've expanded this out on um, the genetics of this, uh, expanded this out from just ATG1601 to other genes such as NOD2, LRRK2, which is really predominant in Asian populations, uh, XBP1 uh, and, and IRGM. What has been a struggle um, in humans, and this is what I'm going to talk about quite a bit uh, in the next two stories, is figuring out what are the environmental triggers here that in a specific um, genetic background can actually create uh, these abnormal panel cells. So initially, um, when we've been working with, with Skip uh, Virgin and Ken Cadwell on this, we had, we had found in our mouse colony that murine norovirus could trigger abnormal panel cells in, in mice, in mice that had ATG1601 uh, defect. The problem is, is we haven't been able to replicate the, the or, or translate this finding from a mouse system into a human system in terms of viruses. So we began looking, so with, with, with in the absence of a, of a chronic virus in the intestine that, that's triggering abnormal panel cells, we started looking for other, um, other types of environmental factors that actually could trigger uh, this, uh, this abnormal panel cell phenotype. And so um, one, of the, one of the obvious factors looking um, using epidemiology is cigarette smoking. So this is a, a, a very important environmental risk factor for Crohn's disease. Um, it, it affects everything from development of the disease, extra intestinal in involvement, severity, and, and poor outcomes. So we hypothesized perhaps that cigarette smoking might, might actually be, in some patients, might be the trigger for panacell defects uh, in patients that had uh, this uh, susceptibility locus ATG16. So the first thing we did is we started we started looking uh, at patients both at WashU at the time I was at WashU uh, and and with my collaborator Dermot McGovern at Cedars Sinai, and we started collecting uh, patients and figuring out whether or not they had, had smoked or not, uh, and looked at this time to recurrence data um, that I showed you before with with whole cohorts. And what was interesting is that the, the faster time so this is just a Kaplan Meier uh, plot showing the time to recurrence um, after resection of uh, in patients with disease. So many patients actually develop severe enough disease where they have to have part of their bowel resected. And then the, the worry is getting a, 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 a recurrence of the disease. And what was interesting is the faster time to recurrence and months post-surgery was always patients that had uh, these, these, uh, these abnormal panel cells uh, and, and these patients with these abnormal panel cells that smoke. So it seemed to be the smokers uh, with abnormal panel cells that were really driving this particular phenotype. So we were very interested then in trying to model this in a mouse system to see if we could actually, first of all, replicate um, some, some of these findings in panic cells, and then to see then if uh, uh, we can study them in panic cells. So, um, so, this is, so this is, uh, this is just a, a calculation then of, of looking at the four different groups, uh, patients that were um, either not smoke, not smoke uh, did not have risk factors for T300A for ATG 1601, and were they either not smoking or were smoking. So you can see that there's four different groups. And it was the group uh, that had the T3, the homozygous for T300A that, that smoked, that had the, uh, the, the, the greatest uh, proportion uh, of, of abnormal panel cells, or, or conversely, the fewest uh, uh, normal panel cells. So all of these patients would, would fit into that. So um, what also is interesting um, it, in these patients is we could detect that um, it, we've been interested for a long time of what these um, abnormal panel cells were actually indicating. Um, and in this case, and in this particular model, what they're associated with, it seems to be a faster time to death. So, it's, so the, this disruption in the packaging of the antimicrobial proteins uh, is associated with greater amounts of apoptosis in the, in the crypt. So this is just shown by, uh, uh, this is tunnel staining, which is not specific for apoptosis, but we can show this also with, with specific apoptosis. 
So what we did is we wanted to translate this then to uh, back translate this to mice to see then if, if we could recapitulate the same phenotype. So we had mice that had that had this uh, from Ramon Xavier that had this T300A uh, ATG1601 allele, and then litter mate controls that didn't have this. And what we used is just a smoking chamber where you can kind of line mice up, line mice up in a chamber and expose them to secondhand smoke for a few hours a day. And when we did this, uh, we, we could do this for, for, as little, um, for as little as four weeks. And we would see uh, that the mice uh, in the T300A smoking group would develop abnormal panel cells at the same number that we would see uh, in, in human patients. So we had a really nice model then for this, uh, for this, particular, uh, for this particular defect. And the apoptosis phenotype that uh, I had mentioned uh, that we could see in this, or the increased cell death phenotype that we could see in the human patients was also replicated uh, in the mouse uh, and the mice as well. So this, this abnormal distribution of, 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 of antimicrobial proteins was associated with accelerated death uh, in these cells that are normally present uh, in the base of the crypt for a few months. Um, we could then give caspase inhibitors, broad-spectrum caspase inhibitors, and we could rescue this phenotype in the smoke, uh, in the smoke mice. So indi indicating that, um, that, um, uh, uh, that, that the cell death then was was, was somehow linked to uh, abnormal panic cells. So you can see, you give the caspase inhibitor, you then have uh, increased numbers of panic cells above 80%, and then the number of apoptotic cells uh, to be much greater. So then, um, so, so, so we were then interested in perhaps if the microbiome was, was actually um, playing a, a, a role here. And we did a lot, a lot of complicated experiments taking uh, microbiome from T300A smoked mice uh, and then transferring this to other uh, to other recipients, and in no cases, no case could we actually transfer the, the phenotype. So it didn't seem that the the micro the changes in the microbiome alone could actually uh, recapitulate this particular phenotype. So then we focused a lot more a lot more closely on the host system and what was actually happening. What was the what was the smoking doing in combination with the T300A mutation that was actually um, altering uh, the function of, of the HANA cells? So we did, uh, we, we did uh, a number of uh, transcriptomic findings, both whole gut and specifically in, in, in uh, laser capture microdissected panic cells, both in T300A mice uh, and, in, and in wild type controls plus or minus smoking. And then look to see for uh, different uh, 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 transcriptome patterns that were present. And what I'm gonna focus on is, is these, uh, this, what we call this G plus C, this genetic plus environmental pattern, comparing uh, you know, T300A smoking to, to, uh, to uh, wild type. And what we saw here, again, what we saw is a, is a transcriptional signature for, for cell death, which uh, fit nicely with what we had uh, seen uh, phenotypically uh, in both humans and mice. But then we also saw uh, in this, this speckled pattern, was a number of metabolic changes that were either upregulated or downregulated um, in, 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 in interesting ways. And all of these, all of these uh, metabolic cascades uh, could somehow be linked back to, uh, to uh, signaling through PPAR, uh, HNF, and RXR types of pathways. So we hypothesized that there would be some sort of uh, some sort of metabolic switch uh, in these cells, and perhaps this is what was driving the, the, the defect in packaging and this increased susceptibility to, uh, to cell death. So one of the one of the pathways that, that to cut a long story short, one of the pathways that was uh, that was downregulated was PPAR uh, gamma. So we simply treated with an agonist, rosiglitazone, in the smoked mice. So we could take the mice and smoke them and give them uh, uh, either vehicle or rosiglitazone. And the rosiglitazone would rescue both the panacell uh, number and create uh, increased numbers of normal panacells and would decrease the, 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 the uh, epithelial cell death in the crypt base. So again, implying that what we had seen transcriptionally then could be functional in these mice. And so this was pretty, this is, Pretty exciting because uh, PPAR uh, gamma agonists have been proposed for a long time for, for IVD. It's been very difficult to actually uh, find it an, an agonist um, that that, um, that 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 um, that really seems to that, that seems to um, not have side effects in this particular population. So I think that this is this I think is where the, the field is stuck. But this is at least some evidence that this particular pathway for penis cells actually might be targeted. So what I've shown you here then uh, for this part of the story is that, that you can um, um, have this 
this gene plus environmental defect. So this is ATG 1601 and smoking is the environmental defect. This combination of defects can decrease uh, PPAR uh, gamma signaling. This then uh, can affect uh, not only penis cell defects, but also uh, 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 the, the ability of these cells to actually survive. And we think that this is, this is, this is in part uh, responsible for what's going on uh, in humans uh, with T300A mutation in this model. And so this work, I think, then fits in really nicely uh, with, with other work, uh, uh, such as uh, Arthur Kayser and, and Rick Bloomberg, who've been very interested in genes like XBP1 that can cause ER stress in panic cells and cause them to malfunction. Uh, they, uh, uh, Rick had a very nice paper in Nature now several years ago, proposing panic cells as an origin of intestinal inflammation uh, and, and, and an inflammatory, a pro-inflammatory environment that they can create through this process of malfunction. We think that this is a, a very interesting and intriguing idea. And what it suggests then is if you can somehow correct this panic cell defect, that this is something that, that could uh, that, that could then uh, remove this, this kind of potential origin for intestinal inflammation and might do, do uh, well in inflammatory bowel disease. We've been uh, very interested in trying to uh, develop autophagy stimulators uh, that can actually try and uh, rescue this particular phenotype. I'll just show you one experiment uh, that we uh, had done with Beth Levine's lab. Um, um, I, I, sadly, she has passed away in, in, in recent uh, years, but she is, of course, a, a giant in the, or was a giant in the autophagy field and discovered uh, one of these uh, autophagy inducers, uh, Becklin-1. And she de developed a peptide that can inhibit the, the degradation of, of Becklin-1. And this is something that was essentially an autophagy activator. So we got this, uh, this autophagy activator from, uh, from her lab and tested this uh, in, our, in our T300A smoking system. So the control here is the scrambled peptide and then the, the, this, this is, the, this is uh, the actual uh, reagent. This is the actual Becklin peptide that, that stimulates autophagy. So all the mice here are T300A. They're, uh, they're either not smoked or they're smoked. And then we measured either the penis cells again or, or cell death. And what was really intriguing is that this particular activator of autophagy can rescue the panic cell defect and can rescue the, uh, the, the, the cell death of the panic cells that are present in the mice. So suggesting at least in principle that, that an activator of autophagy could, uh, could target uh, panic cells and, and, and this could be potentially a therapeutic target. So we're very interested in trying to extend these works perhaps with, with other um, autophagy stimulators uh, or even with this particular so now um, so the problem is, so there's, there's a, um, oh shoot. There's a problem, um, there's a problem though with thinking about just smoking uh, an ATG 1601 as, as the sole cause for abnormal panic cells. Um, the, the fact is, is, is that many children get uh, inflammatory bowel disease um, increasing, and this is increasing. And so, um, and they don't smoke and they probably, and they may or may not have uh, uh, exposure to really high uh, levels of, of, of secondhand smoke. So we were, we've always been wondering if there were other environmental factors that could actually, uh, that, that could actually be triggering panic cells. So Ta Chiang Lu, who's uh, been a, uh, who started with me as a postdoc and now has his own uh, lab at WashU, he, he's, he's, he's immunophenotype now, or a phenotype now over a thousand patients with, uh, for, for panic cell defects and IBD. So we had this great database. So we thought we would go back and look at this database and look at various clinical parameters that also correlated with abnormal panic cells. And we got, we got a really nice hit. The, the one, the one, the one uh, parameter that really seemed to be uh, significantly, statistically significantly different uh, was, uh, was, uh, was, uh, was BMI or, or uh, body mass index. And so patients that had very high body mass index over 25, these patients had uh, had, uh, had fewer numbers of normal panic cells, again, in this range, many in this range below, uh, below 80%. And patients that, that were um, below 25% uh, tended to have higher levels of, of normal panic cells. So we were wondering then if the BMI, the, the, the obvious thing is that the BMI could be related to something like weight. So we uh, decided to, and, and potentially diet as well. So we decided to actually then go in and look in, uh, in, again back in mice to see if we could actually model this in, in mice. So the first thing that we did, we tried a number of diets. 
uh, and the number, the 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 the, uh, the, the diet that actually uh, did the trick was uh, was four weeks of, of Western diet, stimulated or, or created panic cells. Then that were that were uh, the, the normal panic cells were much were lower in abundance than than the mice that were fed standard diet. So this could could again create this shift in the number of normal panic cells that we saw in, in patients with high BMI. Again, modeling this. And the key is, is this didn't take very long for this to occur. We could see this defect in as, as little as four weeks and then was maintained uh, for, for whatever, however long we would keep the mice on Western diet. This, this didn't shift any lower. So this seemed to be uh, the kind of floor in which we could see, uh, we could see any other panacea. We were then interested um, again in the mechanisms that might be um, driving this. So what's what's very interesting is there's no um, there's no genetic background that, that the susceptibility that's required here. It seems that all you need is a wild type mouse and this Western diet, and, and you can create this particular phenotype. So we went in much like we did in our in our smoking experiments, and then looked at, at, at transcriptional patterns um, with or without Western diet uh, in the intestines, uh, both whole gut and with uh, laser capture and microdissected dependent cells. And what was interesting is that there were two main uh, pathways that, that, that seemed to, to uh, tumble out of this. One uh, was, was FXR signaling. Um, so FXR is a is frontosoid uh, X receptor. This is a transcription factor that's, that's downstream, uh, that's activated by secondary bile acids in the intestine. Secondary bile acids are, are produced from primary bile acids that are, that are made uh, in, the, in the liver, and then these get converted to secondary bile acids by specific microbes uh, in the intestine. We saw a really nice signature for FXR, including uh, FGF15, which is a really nice marker for, for FXR activity. But it wasn't just FXR um, activity that we saw. We also saw evidence of elevated uh, type 1 interferons as well. So it looked like the FXR and type 1 interferons were potentially um, um, moving together uh, in this particular uh, um, scenario. And so we decided to follow this. Um, I had a project um, with Mike Diamond looking at chikungunya virus infection um, and the role of the microbiome in controlling chikungunya virus infection in mice. And there, the same pathways where we actually saw were involved, both FXR signaling and type 1 interferon signaling seem to play a role in, in, con in containing chikungunya virus within, within these mice. So this link, this potential link between FXR and type 1 interferon was something then that we wanted to follow up in, in, our, in, in, in this uh, abnormal penicill study. So as I mentioned, uh, these, uh, these secondary bile acids, uh, 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 deoxycholic acid, lithicholic acid are two examples in, in mice. These, um, these are produced from primary bile acids and the, there's uh, members of the intestinal microbiome that, that convert uh, these primary uh, bile acids to secondary bile acids. And if these, uh, both of these, uh, uh, particularly deoxycholic acid, can activate uh, this, this FXR receptor uh, that, that's present on the surface, of, or, or present, I'm sorry, present in the nucleus of, of, of intestinal epithelial cells and a number of other cells. So there's a lot of, another reason we were interested in following this up is there's a lot of um, interest in pharmacologic stimulation of FXR, uh, particularly in, in NASH. So uh, this is, this is, High fat diet does a lot of damage to the liver. Um, and there's some uh, evidence that, that stimulating FXR can mitigate some of these particular uh, defects. There is, a, there is kind of a mixed picture with, with, with FXR uh, agonists. They're not totally benign uh, in every um, tissue or have beneficial effects in, in every disease state. But this is something, but this is something that, that's been of high interest uh, of looking at FXR agonists. Our data would suggest, at least superficially, um, that, that FXR agonists, our hypothesis was, is that FXR agonists would potentially cause abnormal panic cells, which would not be such a beneficial uh, effect of these particular drugs. So we wanted to, to test this to see first if there was any kind of functional effects to, uh, to stimulating, to overstimulating FXR, and, and, and whether, uh, and, and whether, and how this actually uh, related to abnormal panic cells. So as I mentioned before, if panic cells don't function properly, uh, it's, 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 uh, the intestinal microbiome gets changed in locally in the intestine, and then it's easier to infect with pathogens such as salmonella typhimuria. So what we did is we did a very simple experiment where we used a, a, an FX, FXR agonist, GW4064, um, and we pretreated mice for two weeks so that we, they would have abnormal panic cells. 
And then we compared this to two groups where we started uh, the, this agonist uh, at the time of salmonella infection, um, and then or or didn't uh, or didn't give the agonist at all, just gave the E. coli. And what was interesting is that the the mice uh, that were that that were pretreated with the FXR agonist had much higher loads of salmonella and succumbed much more readily than the control groups. Um, you can then kind of flip the script then and, and give this 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 agonist to either wild type mice. Um, or uh, FXR knockout mice, and the FXR knockout mice do much better uh, than the wild type mice, suggesting again that, that FXR signaling uh, is, 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 is potentially affecting panacells. This, this is supportive data that, that, um, that, FXR, that FXR overactivation can potentially affect panacells, affect microbiome or affect the ability of, of, of this particular microbe to, to invade. So then what we wanted to do then is more carefully look at this mechanism. So the first thing that we did is that we uh, that we evaluated the, uh, the secondary bile acids that were present in the intestinal lumen uh, of, of Western uh, diet-fed mice versus standard diet-fed mice, and as expected, we saw elevations in both deoxycholic acid and both the cholic acid uh, in these mice. Um, and then we could give cholestyramine, which can sequester these secondary bile acids, uh, and we could we could uh, reverse the effects of Western diet the, 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 the increase. Abnormal panic cells were then uh, mitigated by cholestyrin, suggesting that, that these, uh, that these uh, secondary bile acids may be, uh, may be functional. We then gave these, uh, we then gave these secondary bile acids uh, individually to, to mice. So instead of Western diet, we then gave, gave uh, either deoxycholic acid or lithocholic acid. And interestingly, only deoxycholic acid uh, uh, recapitulated the abnormal panic cells that we saw uh, in the Western diet, but the lithocholic acid did not. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, GW406 could stimulate uh, uh, abnormal panic cells in, in a fashion very much like Western diet or, or DCA. And this happened in an FXR dependent fashion. When we tested all three of these parameters in FXR knockout mice, we saw, uh, we saw an abrogation of the abnormal panic cells that we saw uh, in the wild type mice. So then um, we, were, we were very interested that then, so, so it looked like FXR was required for this particular phenotype. And then we were very interested in, it, it was FXR signaling within the intestinal epithelium and even within the panic cells themselves, was it actually required for abnormal panic cells? So our hypothesis was that this would be cell intrinsic and this turned out to be the case. So we tested uh, Western diet, DCA and the, the, the FXR agonists uh, in either control mice, FXR flox mice or uh, FXR mice that had, had been deleted from the intestinal epithelium with no increase, and you can get, again see this complete rescue under all these conditions. We also looked at Western diet with, uh, with uh, uh, mice that had a, 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 a flux of FXR specifically within panic cells using a, a panic cell pre, and again we could rescue uh, the defect in, in, uh, in the, the panic cell defect in these particular mice, suggesting that this was uh, in part cell intrinsic uh, uh, signaling of FXR panacells. So, um, so then I also mentioned that type one interferons uh, seem to be linked here. So we wanted to see how type one interferons were linked in with the with the defect that we saw uh, with with, with, with panacells. So first we looked uh, we looked at, at, at tissue uh, type one interferon bioactivity. Uh, in mice that were treated with, uh, with again, this, this agonist for, uh, for FXR. And we could see elevated type one interferon uh, signaling within, uh, within the tissue. We then, um, we then looked in Western, a variety of Western uh, diet fed mice uh, with inhibition of, of type one interferon globally, either with a specific antibody to, uh, to uh, type one interferons, uh, MAR1, or a knockout of the receptor for type one interferons, IFNAR, or the downstream signaling molecules, STAT1. And in all cases, the MAR1 antibody, if NAR, knockout, and STAT1, knockout within the intestinal epithelium, all uh, abrogated the, the penicill defect that we saw. Again, fitting, fitting uh, type 1 interferons potentially in with, uh, with FXR. The problem is, is, is that we looked uh, very carefully um, at type 1, uh, a type 1 interferon uh, bioactivity in mice that had a a deletion in FXR in the delta IECs, and we didn't really we didn't see um, any any change here at all. And so this was this was rather puzzling to us because it didn't quite the, the whole story didn't fit together that all of this everything was going to be cell intrinsic 
uh, within the intestinal epithelial cells. You know, we know that the, the, the source of type 4 interference typically are, are plasmacytes or dendritic cells or other types of myeloid cells. So we started thinking about um, we started thinking about different types of epithelial cells that might um, either be the source of the type 1 interferons or be a, a potentially even a second target for FXR. So what we did is we did a functional experiment testing macrophages where we depleted them with um, with clodronate liposomes and, uh, and and mice that were fed on Western diet. And what we could show is that we could rescue the, the penicillin defect in these particular mice, suggesting that macrophages might be uh, playing a role here. And then we could take isolated macrophages and treat them with a secondary bile acid DCA and show that we could stimulate type 1 interferon activity. So this set up a hypothesis that perhaps macrophages were a secondary target here, uh, that they actually uh, were creating type 1 interferon in, in response to, uh, to secondary bile acids. So we tested this by knocking out the, the, the FXR gene, this time not from the intestinal epithelium, but in macrophages. And um, what, was, what was interesting, so this, this totally uh, abrogated or, or nearly abrogated the type 1 interferon bioactivity uh, in, in Western diet treated mice. Um, but it also rescued the panacell defect uh, as well. So this, this then suggests then that there are, there are, really, um, there are really two different targets then for, for FXR, and you need both of them uh, to actually uh, uh, see, see a particular effect. So what, um, what, what, what you can actually see here is that, that uh, deoxycholic acid from Western diet enhances FXR. This has to have, uh, to, ha to create abnormal panel cells, what you need is you need enhanced FXR signaling, not only within the intestinal epithelium and panel cells themselves, but also within the macrophages as well to stimulate excess type 1 interferon. So it is this, it's this kind of complicated signaling then uh, in this particular system that creates uh, abnormal panel cells. I think this makes sense because it, type 1 interferon on its own would be, would be bad because you, in any viral infection you'd have uh, abnormal panel cells. So it, all, it almost seems like, it almost seems like there's, a, there's a kind of a secondary governor on this situation where you're where you're stimulating high levels of XF, FXR and, and getting essentially signals in two different cell types that then act back on one of the cell types. So then coming back full circle here, so what I've shown you here is, um, is that the, the penicillin abnormalities that we see in, in diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, what's interesting is we've, as we've dug into this, we and others have dug into this over the years, is that there are multiple ways to generate this, this kind of this kind of end phenotype of, of, of abnormal cells. You can do this by, uh, by gene, gene deletions of things like XPP1 that affect ER stress. You can do this uh, by a combination of smoking and defects in autophagy, which can affect metabolism of these cells, leading to their cell death and, and abnormal function. Or you can just simply give a Western diet, which, which I've shown can, can trigger excess F FXR signaling in two different cell types that, that, that together create uh, abnormal panel cells. So I think this is, this is going to be important to think of in terms of uh, uh, the diseases that have abnormal uh, panel cells and, and that you have to think in terms of multiple potential mechanisms. And so I just want to uh, say some, uh, some quick thank yous uh, to, to people that have done the work. Uh, I've had a number of uh, students in my lab uh, and, and various people around WashU that have been uh, extremely helpful. I don't have uh, Skip Virgin and Ken Cadwall who were started this project uh, with me. Dermot McGovern was a, a really important person, a vendor long, a very important person for me for a long time at, at Cedar Sinai, Ron Xavier uh, at MGH, uh, uh, and, and Yoshi Kakura at Tohoku University, and looking uh, beginning to look at patients uh, uh, in, with, with Asian descent uh, that have uh, uh, abnormal panel cells with different genetics. And I really want to give a shout out to Tatian Lu, who uh, who is really a primary driver of a lot of this work that I just talked. And I, as I mentioned, he has his own lab now at WashU. Um, and so as uh, Sean mentioned, I'm now uh, at Cleveland Clinic. And so uh, it's a, this is a, a great place to, to do research. And I'm very interested in, uh, in, our, in our department and faculty hires. Uh, we're doubling the size of our research institute here uh, by 400,000 square feet. So we're going to have be hiring a lot of people and, and looking for people that are interested in working with this world-class uh, institution. So there, I can stop there and take uh, take some questions. Thanks. Okay. So thanks so much, Ted. This is a wonderful talk. A lot of information.
Uh, I think uh, people have questions, can either type your question in the chat box or just to raise your hand. Um, I think I'm going to start to read some questions. Uh, so from Zhi Qiang's question, so um, uh, he's curious about uh, whether chronic smoking rather than four weeks uh, smoke exposure will cause any different phenotype. That's a that's a great question. Uh, so so um, what, what we're very interested in is can you get to a, a situation with smoking um, where, where this won't self correct. So what's very interesting in the mice if we smoke them for four weeks and then stop and let them wash out for a month, the penicill defect will revert, uh, which which we think is is pretty exciting. Uh, it's, it suggests that simply stopping smoking would be enough uh, to uh, to uh, to affect uh, essentially a therapy, which would, which would be great. Um, the problem is, is is we wanted to we wanted to smoke the mice for much longer periods of time. Uh, the problem is, is I think you saw our smoking chamber. Um, the, uh, the the mice when they get they get bigger, they um, they no longer they no longer uh, they no longer really fit in these in these devices. And and in fact, they get so addicted to the cigarette smoke that they press their head up against the the the, the device that delivers the smoke, and they asphyxiate themselves because their their head doesn't fit. So we haven't been able to use older mice to test this hypothesis. Um, one of the one alternative uh, that we're interested in doing with human cells um, that I didn't didn't discuss here is is we're trying to um, we're trying to um, we've collected intestinal epithelial biopsies from these patients, and we're testing them in vitro to see um, if the HANA cells uh, in vitro retain an abnormal phenotype. Uh, and smokers, and I think that that will be uh, something that's highly, uh, highly informative. The challenge is, is panna cells are the one cell type in these organoid systems in humans that is very hard to get to differentiate. So there's been uh, 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 Toshi Sato has a, a really nice paper suggesting that FGFs potentially play a role in, in panna cell differentiation in organoids, um, but that the, the, the panna cells aren't don't have complete differentiation. Uh, with, with the cocktail that he has. So there's still a little bit of work to do to try and get, I think, bona fide planet cells where we could do this type of, uh, this type of lysozyme phenotyping uh, in vitro. But it's, it's a work in progress and I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have something like this uh, uh, in the near future uh, to be able to test this question. And it could be a way then to test if there are permanent defects in the stem cells that, that lead to defects in planet cells, or if this is something that if you just stop smoking uh, you'll be able to revert. Thank you, Ted. Um, Shu, you want to go ahead and ask questions? Hey, that, that's that's amazing talk. Really, really cool work. I have a, a couple of questions. One I test in the, in the chat box is that uh, I wonder whether the smoking uh, changes the food intake for these mice, given the, the role of PBR gamma in the metabolisms. And the, another question along the same line is that, would you think other stresses like confinement that you showed here or potentially starvation may have the same impact on the penis cell? Those are fantastic questions. I, I wish, I, I, we, we have not looked at, at food intake uh, with smoking and, and how, it, how it's affected. I think that that's something uh, that we should definitely um, take a look at, um, but it's a, it's a great suggestion. We also haven't combined the Western diet with, uh, with, the, with the smoking uh, as well. Um, stress to the mice, I think, is something uh, is something that I'm becoming uh, very, very interested in. Um, we've seen we've seen some really interesting functional changes in microbiome with with stress handling of mice, and I think that this is something this is something that that um, I think there's you know there's numerous studies that are, that I've that I've seen that are starting to touch this particular area, but I think it's something that we need to definitely. Pay and definitely you can think in terms of, um, you would normally look at this picture and think of this as a stressful environment. It is the first few days until they get addicted to the nicotine and then it's not stressful, then they won't get <laughs> But it's a great question. That's cool. Uh, another minor question, but more technical question was regarding to this beautiful data you showed with uh, DCA stimulation on macrophage. Is this drastic interferon uh, signal induction? Does the macrophage needs to be primed before the DCA treatment or does just DCA is sufficient to really induce interferon. 
Yeah, so we don't have to prime them. And, and I don't know, I, we haven't tested prime, another really good question. So if we prime them, would it, would it even further enhance this? I, I would imagine it would, but we haven't tested that. Another good question. That's really cool, thanks. Uh, Jim May, uh, you want to ask questions? Go ahead. Okay, uh, maybe I just read the question. So, um, so the question is, except for Penicel, are there defects existing in other epithelial subset of um, the, um, the, the, the IBD patient? I think this is a relatively general um, question. I guess um, uh, the question is gonna be, when you actually observe the CD patient or the IBD patient, is there any other defect particular besides the Penicel you observe? Yeah, I think I think I think this is I think this I think the panic cells, um, in terms of like the autophagy story, panic cells are the most sensitive cell to loss of autophagy, but it doesn't mean that there aren't other cell types that are gonna uh, that are gonna potentially show um, defects. I think goblet cells for sure we've shown in mice um, have defects. We haven't we haven't translated this to humans, but it wouldn't surprise me if there were effects on on mucin production. Enterendocrine cells have, have, have fascinated me for a long time, and, and I think that these these easily could be uh, a target uh, as well. And so, um, so I would say I would say definitely yes, there probably will be other other targets. Panda cells are just the most obvious to us when we when we look on tissue sections. Thank you. Um, so then, uh, the next question is: um, in obesity induced panda cell reduction or defect. Is this effect is because of the high fat diet or because of the high fat diet induced microbiome uh, difference alteration? Right, that, that's a great question. I didn't talk about the microbiome uh, uh, stuff with the, with the Western diet. The only the only place where the microbiome is required in this particular model is is actually in the conversion of the primary to secondary bile acids. Again, there's there's no ability to just simply transfer microbiome. To create this, so we think that this is a metabolic effect, uh, primarily on the host. Great question. So here, the, the following is: uh, if you have actually, when you look at the different um, bile acid, if the palmitic acid affect the the penicillin. Yeah, this is a great question. So there's been some really uh, amazing. Um, Amazing studies looking at, 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 at additional metabolites of bile acids, right? So they're much more complicated than just TCA and LCA. And we haven't looked at them yet because of the pandemic. <laughs> so, yeah, there's. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I would love to know, but I would love to know uh, specifically uh, specifically uh, uh, if, if there's, if there's going to be more uh, specific uh, uh, alterations to say the DCA. It's a good, good question. So um, I think I have a couple of questions uh, following that. So first is is regarding the uh, defect of the autophage, uh, the ATG sixteen L one. Uh, you described that um, this actually um, influenced the penicillin uh, defect, but actually, um, as far as I know, the previous publication from your lab actually talked about ATG five influenced the uh, the goblet cell. And then I'm wondering whether the autophage machinery actually is generally affect the packaging and secretion of all the entero endocrine cell uh, functionality. What can you comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I think I, I, we haven't looked specifically at enteroendocrine cells, and given your your recent findings with enteroendocrine cells, it would be a really great place to look and to see and to see if secretion is, is abnormal in enteroendocrine cells. I don't know if it is or not. And um, it would be, I think, fascinating to actually test this. Um, but do you see the ATG16 uh, deficient animal also have uh, issue with the goblet cells? They do, yeah, we, have, we haven't published that. The, the paper that we published was mostly focused on ATG5, um, but, but ATG16 alone will work for that. Okay, um, my second question is regarding to the smoking, um, the disease model. So uh, you're saying that the environment and the intrinsic uh, gene, gene uh, genotype um, actually combine induced susceptibility of the IBD. But my question, first of all, is whether the smoking alone 
actually induce any um, change of pattern cell, or you do need a somehow a vulnerability of the genome to actually um, elevate the phenotype. Yeah, I'm sorry, I went through that fast. Um, it, it, the, the smoking alone does not affect panic cells. So it, it really, at least in the, in, the, in the mouse model that I'm showing here, it's only really the, the, the mice with the T300A mutation and the smoking that have abnormal, increased abnormal cells. But, but can you actually, um, I, I think it's, it's curious that um, because the smoking obviously enhanced the PPAR gamma signaling, but why you think it's need a combination with susceptible uh, gene to actually induce the phenotype? Yeah, I think I think this has to do with the fact that that the that the gene um, the gene under non-stressful conditions or non-inflammatory conditions is is essentially is essentially intact. And and what Romnick's lab uh, I think really nicely showed is is that um, is that, that stress conditions can uh, can essentially that, that T300A site becomes a, a site of cleavage and you essentially break apart the, the, the protein and it's no longer functional. So I see. Yeah. Okay. And then the following that, um, whether it be um, the combination of these two, the smoking and then the T300, actually also can um, modulate the other um, epithelial phenotype. Again, I think it's, I, I, I'm coming back again, again, back to goblet cells. Uh, yeah. What do you think on that? Yeah, we, we, ha we haven't tested that, but it, it's, it's a really, it's a, it's a good thought that, these, that, this, that this could have effect on other, uh, other secretory cells. Um, the, the, the diet for sure affects goblet cells, um, and, uh, it, but it also could affect endocrine cells as well. I see. Um, uh, my second sort of question is regarding to this really uh, potent um, anti-autophage uh, peptide that the uh, Beckling one. This is really amazing. Um, but actually, I'm curious that because you um, apply this on the uh, the deficient animal, I'm just wondering whether if you do on the white time mice, do you have the treatment effect on the um, colitis? Oh, right. Yeah, we have. We so that that's a <laughs> that's a great that's a great experiment. So. Um, we uh, we're doing those experiments, so they're they're in progress. Yeah. Okay. 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 It's very important to know if this is be Yeah, I, I just uh, I mean it's really uh, astonishing that to see this combination with the stability gene and then the environment to stimuli because I think in your uh, description that um, you do need both of them actually have the uh, strong phenotype and then somehow one of them actually cannot be sufficient to trigger the final consequence. I mean, this is really amazing. I, I just, uh, you know, it took a lot of thought to actually uh, figure out machinery uh, behind that. Um, so my last part is actually regarding this Western diet part, um, because obese obviously can uh, really impact the penis cell functionality and survival. But uh, this actually regard, uh, relate to the first question. When you talk about the smoking, you say when the mouse stops smoking, the phenotype reverse. My same question, when you stop the high fat diet, can you actually reverse the phenotype as well? Exactly, so we can. So, so it, it, it's, it's, this, it's the same thing. So if we, again, th these are short-term experiments. So we go for four weeks and then, and then do a washout for two or four weeks. And four weeks is enough of a washout where the panda cells revert back to normal. So, okay. So we can, we can see that. Um, so, but, but when you actually talk about the Western diet, actually um, you related to the FXR, which actually um, a quite interesting uh, thing because there's uh, multiple paper described that if, uh, FRX actually relate to this uh, intestinal stem cell regeneration and survival. So my question is regarding to that during your salmonella model or any uh, inflama inflammation model, the cell apoptosis on the penis cell or the um, enhancement of the disease, could that be because of the uh, lack of the capacity in the regeneration of the stem cell instead yeah. of penis cell alone? Yeah, so Michael Karens did some really nice work uh, with FXR agonists, um, really in cancer to show that it, that, that it, can, it can mitigate uh, uh, cancer, uh, FXR agonists. Um, I think I think what our work shows is at least that that, that 
for all the potential benefits of an FXR agonist as, as an anti-inflammatory, um, one of the one of the worrisome things is that what one of the worrisome side effects could be this kind of self effect, right? And so the question is, is I think what's the trade off going to be? Is is can, or is it is it enough to just try and stop the inflammation, or is having this background kind of self defect a problem? So I think for us, this is something that we wanted to raise in that particular field. So people are just aware of that. But but when you but when you apply the antagonist on the in vivo, um, I would assume that uh, when you rescue the phenotype on the penicillin. You also actually impact the stem cell at the same time, right? We haven't seen we haven't seen um, in this particular system we haven't seen dramatic effects on the stem cell, uh, but we haven't really tested for it. So, but nothing obvious. Okay, okay. I uh, sure you have more questions. Yeah, I just want to squeeze in one more question. Uh, uh, this is a more general question. Since you were talking about the the gene environment interactions, I'm always curious that many of the GWAS hits they are common alleles which means there are high prevalence of the population. And in many cases, when the genes are such essential, uh, their, their alleles may have certain beneficial effects in some other scenarios. And do you know in this case, in the, in the ATG16 outcome, what was the pre-mutation was, in any cases, they may be protective by DB instead of uh, causing more severe IBDs. Right. Yeah, I think so this is something that's been speculated on. Um, there's even some some evidence that there's some potentially some some beneficial effects in certain types of infection, um, uh, such as uh, interestingly uh, your genital types of infection. The ATG1601 mutation may be beneficial, uh, which is which is uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, but the, the the other really interesting thing is that the ATG1601 mutation. It's not a susceptible. This mutation exists uh, in countries like uh, Japan, but it's not a susceptibility allele for IBD in Japanese. So we published that. We published that a, a, a few years ago. Uh, there are other. There are other. There are other alleles that seem to be. Uh, again, that exist in in Caucasians, uh, in the U.S. and Europe that don't cause much trouble, but actually then are susceptibility alleles in Japan that lead to abnormal pigment cells. So I think, I think this is something that we don't understand is, the, is, is I think genetic background um, and other genes are gonna play a role here um, and, and, and we don't yet understand. Um, or other components of the environment that we, we were just missing. So, um, so I think this is, um, this is something that we're still trying to understand. Thank you. Okay, so um, anyone else have question for Ted? Seth? If not, if you have a further question regarding the study, uh, I think I believe Seth will be happy to take questions from email. Um, and um, um, in this case, then uh, thanks so much again for the one for seminar. I think we learned a lot from your, uh, your study. And then hopefully uh, we'll see each other face to face soon. Absolutely. Yes. Thanks to everyone. I really appreciate the questions were phenomenal. And thanks. Thanks, uh, everyone. I really, uh, this was really interesting for me too. Thank you. Thank you, Sad. Thank you very much. Good, good, good night. Good night. Yeah.